Hi everyone, my name is Todd Beach. I teach AP European History at Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. That's a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We're here to talk to you about the DBQ today. And I'm Katie Lancy. I teach at Coral Gable Senior High School in Miami, Florida. And yeah, we're gonna get you started on the beginning of the document-based question on the couple early points in the rubric, and then we're gonna continue in our last video, video eight. So you can see the DBQ is a really important part of the AP exam. It is 25% of your total score. The recommended time for the document-based question is one hour, which includes a 15 minute suggested reading period for you to read the documents. And of course, this is a document-based question. So students are gonna be presented with seven documents that will offer various perspectives on historical developments or processes. So students are going to assess these written quantitative or visual materials as historical evidence. I tell my students they're gonna put on their historian hat and they're gonna look at this evidence. Um, they're gonna be text-based and there's also gonna be a visual source of some type Students are gonna develop an argument that is supported by the analysis of that historical evidence. So they are going to be reading these documents and developing an argument and using the documents to support their argument. The DBQ will be on a question that focuses on topics in AP Euro starting at 1600 and going pot potentially as far as 2001. So 1600 to 2001 is the range for the document-based question. All right, so in our last video, we talked about these two skill points for the long essay, and today we're gonna talk about them for the document-based question. So we have part A of the rubric, the thesis or claim. Students are gonna be expected to respond to the prompt with a historical, historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning. That line of reasoning is really important. So we're gonna make sure that we don't miss that. Uh, students need to have that thesis statement in one place, either in the introduction, or it can be wholly in the conclusion. And Todd and I are gonna urge you to make sure that you're putting it in both places um, so that you're kind of covering yourself. But we definitely want it at the beginning of the essay, at the end of the first paragraph, and we'll talk a little bit more about structure in a minute. The other thing that students need to do is they need to provide a broader historical context that is relevant to the prompt, right? So that's really important that they are setting the stage in that first paragraph, and we're gonna give you some structure for that. And to earn this point, they need to be developments that are um, during, before, or continue after, and it needs to be a solid paragraph. It needs to be more than just a phrase or a reference. So we want to make sure that we're really developing an introductory paragraph that makes sure we're including context in that intro. You want to do a little bit about structure, Todd? Sure. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Here's the prompt that we're working with. Um, evaluate whether or not the Catholic Church in the 1600s was opposed to new ideas in science. And so when you get the free DBQ, you're gonna pre-write because you have some time. You're, you're gonna to need to read the prompt and then you're gonna start reading through the documents. We want you to make a simple T-chart as you're reading the documents to help you organize them as you read and annotate the documents. So you're making a simple T-chart and then we're gonna put as our categories, the parts of this particular uh, prompt. So they're asking about whether or not the Catholic Church was opposed to these new ideas. So one side of our T-chart is, well, were these documents going to support they were opposed? And there are probably going to be some documents that say was not opposed or hint at, infer that they were not opposed. And you might even have a document or two that you feel like are in the way or could be used either way. But this T-chart, as you're doing your pre-writing, will help you get going uh, as you get going on, as you start to read and unpack your DBQ. So you would put in there as an example, like doc two would be an example, or doc one. That way you're starting to organize your thinking as you're reading the documents. Step two, we want you to use a structure to compose your response. So we talked about um, how to do context in a previous video. 
And we talk about this upside down triangle where we're gonna begin broadly and then narrow down to our arguments. So we wanna do context and thesis and that would be our first or introductory paragraph. Our thesis needs to give us a couple reasons or a line of reasoning. So reason number one is what we're gonna talk about in paragraph, body paragraph one. And then reason number two would be what we talk about in body paragraph two. Those reasons we're gonna construct with topic sentences and we're gonna support our reasoning using the evidence or the documents of the DBQ. We're gonna suggest that you provide a third body paragraph with an alternative claim of evidence. And we're gonna talk about that when we look at the C and D points of the rubric. Um, but keep an eye on this structure uh, as we get to these other parts of the rubric in a later video. And then we're gonna suggest as you conclude that you're going to do it kind of backwards. You restate your thesis, and then you talk about context going forward, like this led to this other part of history. So within a DBQ structure, that's the basic paragraph structure. We're talking about a five paragraph structure for this particular prompt. And we also need to source at least three documents. When we talk about sourcing, we're talking about making the documents happy. That's an acronym for historical situation, audience, purpose, um, point of view, and the why is for why is it significant. You also need to include one piece of outside evidence that supports your argument. So you're going to be using the documents in the body of the pair of the essay, and you want to include somewhere an outside piece of evidence that is linked to the argument as well. That will get us those points on, on the DBQ rubric. So if we go to the next slide and we look at our upside down triangle, we've got the prompt there evaluate whether or not the Catholic Church in the 1600s was opposed to new ideas in science. And now we're looking at a paragraph structure. So again, we really like this idea of starting broadly. We're gonna construct the historical context by beginning broadly and then narrowing down by being more specific and heading towards that thesis claim that Todd's gonna to talk about in a minute, but we really like this structure to organize you because you can follow this structure on both the essays that you have to write on the AP exam. We talked about it in the last video for the long essay, and we're talking about it now for the document-based question. Todd, you wanna talk about the thesis? Yeah, thanks, Katie. So skill six is argumentation. We have to develop our argument. And as Katie said, we wanna begin by situating the reader and beginning broadly, and then narrow down to our argument. Skill six, we have to make a historically defensible claim. So it has to be accurate. And we also need for this exercise, have a line of reasoning. So we're gonna establish a position or argument that we can defend with evidence. Really want you to take a position. When they give you a prompt, especially the structure we just saw, evaluate whether or not, they really want you to take a position. Don't try to argue both. Take a position that is your primary position and defend it with evidence. Use the language of the prompt to create that. It's not simply a restatement of the prompt but we want a response that takes a position and gives us that line of reasoning. So let's look at that structure. Here's our prompt to evaluate whether or not the Catholic Church in the 1600s was opposed to new ideas in science. And so our thesis, we're gonna use the stem of the prompt to respond to the prompt, okay? The Catholic Church in the 1600s was or was not, you need to take a position opposed to new ideas in science because, and this is gonna be our line of reasoning, so we're taking a position, you're gonna choose, they were or they were not based on your interpretation of the evidence. And then we're gonna have our line of reasoning, reason number one and reason number two. Those are our lines of reasoning. All right, so let, let's look at a sample that does the things that we just were telling you about. A response that has context and thesis and does both of these in the paragraphs in the way that we're talking about. So if we read through this sample, let's do that together. Um, we're gonna look for the thesis and claim getting one point, and we're gonna look for context getting the one point for context. All right, so in the 1600s, the Catholic Church was still recovering from a large exodus of its members from the Protestant Reformation. In order to maintain a place in European society, the church had to address the problem. One of their most notable responses is the Council of Trent, which ended practices like indulgences and relics, while also reaffirming church doctrine. After this challenge to the Catholic authority occurred, the scientific revolution blossomed. 
With this came much conflict between the church and science, mostly relating to the heliocentric model. Really nice, rich context there, right? There's a lot of stuff going on there. I like that a lot. And then we move on to, to a large extent, the Catholic church was opposed to new ideas expressed by science because they rendered a literal interpretation of scripture false. However, to a lesser extent, the church was not opposed to these ideas because some science was clearly observable and being explored by some prominent members of the clergy. So they have a really complex thesis. And while Todd said for you not to take more than one position, they take a position and then they are alluding to doing more than that with the second uh, part of the thesis statement. So this is a really nice example that would get the point for thesis. It uh, definitely earned one point because it stated that the Catholic church was opposed as potential threats to the little, literal interpretation of the Bible and also supported some scientific ideas as observable truths. And then it also clearly received the point for context. It had specific information about the roles of the Protestant Reformation the scientific revolution, talking about the Council of Trent. And so really, really nice context uh, there that would definitely earn the point. Really love that thesis because they do take a primary position and then they say, however, to a lesser extent, it kind of foreshadows that we're gonna have to give you some alternative evidence too. Uh, and it hints at complexity of their essay. Really yeah, great job. Yep, absolutely. So our key takeaways, Structure, we want to make sure we have the introductory paragraph structure we've been saying begin broadly and then narrow down to being more specific while leading to your argument, which is your claim or thesis. Include your thesis with a line of reasoning as the final sentence or sentences of the introductory paragraph. That is our strategy that we're suggesting for you. We need to unpack C and D points of the DBQ. Watch session or video number eight. Learn how to write the rest of the DBQ the C and D points. Thank you so much for watching.